Well, hello and welcome to another edition of Game On, exclusive to Kalkine TV. I'm James Preston and in this episode, the Olympics near their close as Australia continues to punch above their weight in the medal count. Lionel Messi is on the lookout for a new club and Adam Santarossa lets us know where he might end up. And of course, we'll take a look at the finances off the field with sports business as the La Liga sells off 10% of its stake in the competition. Let's start today's show with sports news. Well, we simply must begin with the Olympics. How incredible have our athletes been? At the time of this program, Australia is sitting fourth on the medal tally with an incredible 17 golds alongside five silver and 19 bronze for a total of 41 medals. The tally means that Australia has now equaled its greatest ever gold medal haul, a record previously set at the 2004 Athens Olympic Games. Thursday was an eventful day for Australia, with skateboarder Keegan Palmer claiming gold in the inaugural event. The 18-year-old threw down the gauntlet with 94.04 points in his first run before incredibly bettering his score to 95.83 in his third and final routine. Palmer, who is now based in San Diego, said that he, quote, put in a lot of hard work over the last couple of years. It paid off today and I'm so grateful to be able to bring the gold back to Australia. It means the world to me because that's where it all started. His 90-plus score finished well clear of Brazilian silver medalist Pedro Barrios's 86.14 and also American Corey Janot, who claimed bronze with 84.13. Just moments before Palmer claimed his gold and Australia's 17th, Jean van der Westhausen and Tom Green brought home gold in the K2 1,000-metre rowing by blitzing their final to finish first. This was the 16th gold medal for Australia and the first ever for the Aussies in that event. Away from gold, and Australia continued to excel in new events. Ash Maloney became Australia's first ever Olympic decathlon medalist. The decathlon, which features 10 gruelling events that cover almost every track and field discipline, is regarded as the most difficult competition at the Olympics. 21-year-old Maloney, who is the Australian record holder, claimed bronze behind world record holder Kevin Meyer, who claimed silver, and Canada's Damian Warner, who claimed gold. Maloney, who was in his first games, came into the night session sitting second overall, but was passed by Mayer in the javelin, as expected. And this meant that Maloney had to finish within seven seconds of fourth-placed American Garrett Scantling to claim a medal, and he did so, and did his country very proud for that matter, by finishing just over four seconds behind him to claim bronze, with teammate Cedric Dubler sacrificing his own race in order to keep a lookout for Maloney, and both competitors have now been dubbed as heroes. Well, it was bronze and jubilation for Maloney, but silver and heartbreak for the Kookaburras, who suffered a nail-biting loss in their gold medal match against Belgium. With scores tied at one apiece, the match went into a penalty shootout. Belgium goalkeeper Vincent Vanache was the hero, saving multiple penalties. Belgium went off a little early, though, in their celebrations, with Vanache ruled to have impacted Australian Jake Weddon's foot, and the Kookaburras were subsequently given one last chance to stay in the hunt. But unfortunately, Whedon missed again and it was all over. The Kookaburras were aiming for their first gold medal since Athens 2004, with the result an improvement on their sixth place finish at Rio in 2016. We'll take a look at football and basketball from the Olympics soon, but first let's do a quick little wrap up of the Olympics itself and a few interesting talking points to have come out of the Games as they draw to a close in Tokyo. Firstly, the addition of the likes of skateboarding and sport climbing have been incredibly welcome to this year's Olympics. Both have acted as ratings winners for Seven's coverage of the Games and sports climbing in particular has seen an enormous surge as a result of its appearance in the Games on both Google and also YouTube. Romain Thevenot, the chair of Sport Climbing Australia, believes the Olympic debut represented the beginning of a new era, which could see a huge expansion in the number of people taking to the walls. He stated, It's been a long road. The International Federation has been working towards it becoming an Olympic sport for more than 10 years. So it's a big game changer for the world of climbing, and it's also a big game changer for the world of climbing in Australia. Already more than 200,000 people frequent climbing facilities across Australia, and the sport is now expected to absolutely explode moving forward. 
On a sour note though, the Olympics, despite preventing protest or brash statements on podiums, continues to be a political lightning rod. We can certainly all have our opinions on the watchability of certain competitions, and for years now the 50km race walk has endured terrible TV ratings and a rather average attendance. It's certainly an event that younger viewers have trouble getting into. It's also the only event at the Olympics that only pertains to men, with no female equivalent on the cards. Instead of addressing this by providing an option for women to compete in, or relating to concerns about exhaustion and extreme dehydration, perhaps providing for a 25 km walking event for women, in the name of gender equality, the event which has been a staple of the Olympics since its introduction at the 1932 Los Angeles Games, will now be scrapped. Keep in mind though, the International Olympic Committee is the exact same organisation that will allow a transgender athlete, Laurel Hubbard, born as a male before transitioning, to compete against women in weightlifting. That of course means concerns around biological differences including testosterone levels, fast twitch muscle fibres and bone structures were all ignored in the name of progression. The IOC needs to pick a lane. You cannot possibly make two different decisions based on the same science. The 50 km walk is thought to be too gruelling for women to compete in, so in order to achieve gender parity, we scrap it. A biological male competing against women in a competition pertaining to strength? Apparently that's completely fine. No disrespect to Harvard. If you wish to transition, that's your decision and you're right. But the moment it begins to impact female athletes who otherwise might have an opportunity to compete on the biggest stage and represent their country, that's when we have a problem. More on the Olympics in just a moment, but before we head to a break, there is plenty happening in the world of rugby league. COVID and its associated restrictions have claimed another victim with the Rugby League World Cup now officially being postponed until 2022. Australia and New Zealand had earlier pulled out of the tournament over concerns about player safety and well-being in addition to concerns about potential border closures. With the reduced player availability and concerns about the overall quality of the competition, organisers decided against pushing ahead with the Cup, with the Rugby League World Cup 2021 Chief Executive John Dudden providing this update. Hello. First of all, I'd like to sincerely thank you for your support, for your patience and your understanding. As you'll appreciate, the last few weeks have been very challenging for the Rugby League World Cup. The withdrawals of Australia, New Zealand and the subsequent challenges we faced have presented us with a very difficult decision and very difficult circumstances. We have, with the, the deepest regret and bitter disappointment, decided that we cannot stage the tournament this year in the way we would hope. Therefore, we are going to stage the tournament next year. It is going to be the biggest and best ever Rugby League World Cup. And we want to do that with you. We would love you to continue your fantastic support. You've already pledged your support by purchasing tickets and we need you to hang on in there, keep supporting us, keep following our journey, keep staying with us. Rugby League has always overcome adversity. We are resilient, the sport is resilient and we will continue to be. We will continue to create social change. We will continue to strive towards creating amazing memories. Please stay with us and wholeheartedly from myself, my team, my board, everyone involved, thank you so much for your support. Organisers of the 2021 Rugby League World Cup are yet to confirm the rescheduled dates. Still with Rugby League and with England for that matter and Mark Grattan, the managing director of Super League Club, the Castleford Tigers, has tabled a proposal for a new competition to replace the reserves called Lightning Rugby, which would consist of eight-man teams playing matches in short spells. The competition is designed to introduce a faster, more exciting version of the game in a bid to halt the decline in attendances in Super League fixtures. Grattan said, quote, We need to do something radical to get the fans back. He argues that the competition would allow clubs to open their doors more often, and as a result, it would thereby increase revenue streams and also give season ticket holders more value for money. All right, don't go too far. The latest from the world of football and basketball next with Adam Santarossa on Game On. Adam Santarossa, thank you so much for joining Game On. Good to be here, James. 
Mate, always a pleasure to have you. Let's start with the biggest piece of news in the footballing world. Leo Messi, well, the deal looked to be signed, sealed and delivered for the Argentinian to remain with FC Barcelona, but that now won't be the case. I'll read the full statement, which will pop up on the screen as well. Now, this is from FC Barcelona. It says, despite FC Barcelona and Lionel Messi having reached an agreement and the clear intention of both parties to sign a new contract today, this cannot happen because of Spanish La Liga regulations on player registration. As a result of this situation, Messi shall not be staying on at FC Barcelona. Both parties deeply regret that the wishes of the player and the club will ultimately not be fulfilled. FC Barcelona wholeheartedly expressed its gratitude to the player for his contribution to the aggrandizement of the club and wishes him all the very best for the future in his personal and professional life. Now, th this is huge. Can you make sense of what's gone wrong here? Yeah, it's a, look, it's a bizarre situation. And we felt there was an agreement made between Messi and Barcelona, you know, a couple of months ago where there was some conjecture of where he'd go and whether he would stay at the club. And it seemed like that was all put to bed. Uh, and then to, to read this this morning, uh, obviously, uh, it just, it, it's hard to really grasp Messi playing for someone else that, that's not Barcelona. And in terms of where he will go, uh, again, it, it's difficult to really pinpoint uh, who's got the financial capacity to, to take a player like Lionel Messi. I mean, he's on pretty astronomical wages at Barcelona, which I think is the real sticking point uh, in this deal in that um, he's in the back end of his career and anyone making that investment, I don't know how they'll be able to justify the expense. Uh, obviously, there'll, there'll be some sort of a transfer fee. I don't think Barcelona will recoup anywhere near what they, they should expect, uh, but the wages will still be astronomical. And given the age and given his career trajectory, I don't know who necessarily will want to take that move. Now, we also know in the past there has been a buyout clause attached to Messi, and that's obviously in addition to any transfer fee. Would you imagine, given that neither party has come to an agreement here, that buyout clause is now off the table, so that might potentially make it easier for other clubs to sign him? Yeah, there's been speculation that Barcelona would waive it in entirely, but uh, I still think they'd look to recoup something. Um, obviously, that buyout clause was pretty much astronomical. A lot of clubs w looked at it and, and thought, there's no way we're going to pay that. So that's what's really has stopped the offers over the years from really coming to the club. But I think, uh, you know, there'll be some clubs looking, but given how big his wages are, uh, that buyout clause would have to be, you know, fairly, fairly minuscule when you think about the wages that the club would have to take on because, you know, there's FIFA financial fair play laws now, which a lot of clubs have flouted and they're becoming more stringent on. So any club that does make a move, they're going to have to be pretty good with the accounting to ensure that they, uh, you know, get the ticks from, uh, their respective bodies so well look they might need the help of nick politis from the roosters then to get that one over the line but i mean one criticism that is often leveled at Lionel messi is that he hasn't tested himself in a big league like the english premier league yes la liga is a, a huge competition in its own right but when the debate gets thrown up between ronaldo and messi it's well you know ronaldo's been with man united in the premier league he's now playing in the Serie a with juventus and so many other competitions that he's been a part of and has been successful where do you think he should go? And if he was, for example, to go to the English Premier League, would that do a lot of good for him in terms of that debate? Yeah, I don't think he'll end up in the Premier League. I just think, you know, it's a league that players transitioning from La Liga and in other leagues, Serie A and even Germany, have struggled because the Premier League is, is very intense. It's a very physical league. Mm. It's a high tempo to the likes of La Liga and Serie A, which are a lot more technical. So I think if he goes anywhere, I think he probably goes to Serie A. I think he may, uh, he could potentially end up at somewhere like Inter Milan or AC Milan, who are looking to sort of make a statement. Uh, obviously Inter won Serie A last year, AC Milan uh, had their best year in quite some time as they sort of try to break the shackles that Juventus have had for so long in that competition. There's also the MLS, which has been touted. Uh, he was linked to David Beckham's uh, Inter Miami franchise um, and, and there was, an agreement that when he did finish with Barcelona, he was meant to then join that club. So that could be brought forward. But again, uh, it will come down to the wages and, and what club deems him, you know, beneficial to what they have and, and whether they can really see it as a, as a, a decent investment. I think clubs in the MLS are, are more likely, uh, even the Middle East potentially, because, you know, new franchise like David Beckham's, which is now a couple of years old, they're still looking to sort of make a statement. Uh, and we've seen those signings, Beckham himself, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, et cetera, um, that have really 
put those sides on the map uh, internationally. So that's an option. Uh, Serie A is an option. I don't think he goes to the Premier League. I just think, as I said, it's it's a very physical league. Given his age, I don't know he'll have the impact that, given given his wages and given the transfer fee, he would expect. There was talk of Man City, given his relationship with Pep Guardiola, but given they've been linked to Jack Grealish and, and even Harry Kane, uh, I, I don't know how you fit Lionel Messi into that uh, from a from a finance point of view, but also the, just the squad itself, given what they have already. Well, let's talk about Man City and Harry Kane. It looks like Jack Grealish is all but confirmed to be going there now. Harry Kane is the one where there's a bit more conjecture as to will he or won't he. Steven Gerrard, for example, has come out and said, look, you know, think about your overall legacy. You've been with Spurs for pretty much, well, I mean, realistically, the entirety of his career now, and what that might do to his standing amongst fans and amongst his, I suppose, legacy within the Premier League. Would it be a wise move for him to go to Man City in potentially the pursuit of a Premier League title? Or should he remain where he is? And for that matter, do you think Manchester City can potentially get his signature? Yeah, he's obviously, there's, there's some games being played. He's obviously staying away from training and, and he's, he's doing the negotiations behind the scenes for the moment. Uh, I mean, players can certainly force the club's hand uh, to some degree, but ultimately the club need to agree on the transfer fee. And, and uh, Levy and Tottenham have shown over the years that they're not one to budge from, from the price tag they set on players. Uh, and that certainly seems the case. I mean, there's been figures of 140 million bandied around for, for Harry Kane, which, you know, I don't, as, as good as Harry Kane is, I, I don't think that's a fee that, that clubs would want to agree on, even if it is Man City, who, who have a sizable checkbook. But uh, I think this is a sign of the, just the frustration of Harry Kane. I think he doesn't see uh, Tottenham being competitive in the Premier League. I mean, they, they got to the Champions League final. They were in the top four for a number of years. Um, you know, we saw under Mourinho, they really went backwards and, and they're continuing to do so. And they've the real hesitancy to invest in the squad. And I think this is Harry Kane showing those frustrations and, and similar to, to Steven Gerrard, who, you know, noticeably had that offer from Chelsea all those years ago and the temptation of the Champions League and to win Premier League titles, ultimately decided to go to Liverpool. And uh, Harry Kane's at that very point of his career now where he needs to decide, as you said, is it legacy or is it you know, ambition of winning Champions Leagues and winning titles that, to be fair, I don't think Tottenham will, will have for at least the short term. Yeah, it'll be a really interesting one to see how it plays out. But let's now shift across from world football to the Olympics more specifically. And uh, obviously the Oli Roos gone last week, but the Matildas now, they've just fallen agonisingly short of a bronze medal against the US. Yeah, very good tournament from from the Matildas. There's a bit of a, a mixed reviews, I guess, here in Australia. I think the fact that, you know, it's the best finish at the Olympics. So there's obviously positives uh, that we need to, to come out of the tournament. But uh, I think for mine, there's some, some issues defensively that were really a, a highlight uh, and really their Achilles heel throughout the tournament. They average nearly three goals conceded a game uh, throughout the Olympics, which you're not going to win a, a major tournament conceding that many goals a game. So. Uh, it did really hurt them, but as I said, there's still plenty of positives in an attacking sense. They're, they're such a threat going forward and, and we've shown we can take it to the best teams in the world. Uh, you know, we fell to Sweden and the USA twice in the tournament, who are the top two in the world. So uh, it does show we're perhaps a little bit down from those elite teams, but you know, looking forward at the Asian Cup to come and then a home World Cup in a couple of years' time, there's still plenty to like. and, and Again, a high-level tournament for some young players to get some more experience. We saw Mary Fowler, Kyra Kroonie Cross, uh, Tegan Micah in goals as well, get some really valuable minutes. So uh, the new generation is really going to, uh, I guess, evolve out of this tournament, but still a little bit to work on. But I think overall, fourth is, uh, you know, agonizingly short of a medal, but still the best uh, tournament we've ever had. So um, it's hard to be too critical overall. Well, look, speaking of falling just short of a medal, let's switch gears now to basketball and we'll start with the Opals. They got stuck at the quarterfinal stage. It was always going to be a very tough ask, though, to, to come up against the US, who have won six consecutive golds, dating all the way back to the 1996 Atlanta Games. This one pretty much went how I think we thought it would. Yeah, the Opals, you know, they'll be very disappointed with their campaign. I mean, they were fortunate to get out of the group, uh, which I don't think anyone would have thought that, given... Uh, the teams we had in there, Belgium, who were on Olympic debut, China and, and Puerto Rico. And, and you know, we, we basically got in on points differential to the next stage, which saw us line up against the USA. And I think 
the train sort of went off the tracks in that first game against Belgium and, and never really got back on there, to, to be fair. Uh, I think you can point to the Liz Cambage incident uh, in the pre-camp at Vegas, given how influential she is to the team and, and how they play as well at both ends of the court. A lot goes through her, so for her to withdraw uh, on the eve of the tournament and then in the circumstances she did, uh, it was certainly destabilising and we saw that on the court. And, and as I said, once things went awry, they just never seemed to to get it back. And um, yeah, disappointing for the Opals. I think they would have expected a lot more. I mean, just as we finish up, Adam, let's have a look at the men's for basketball. The US, once again, our Achilles heel, it seems to be a continuing theme across, you know, the Matildas, the Opals and the Boomers. Really strong fight, but just falling short. Not all done with yet, though. Still a chance for a bronze medal. Yeah, one of those games where we pretty much played the perfect first half of basketball. I mean, the, the first few minutes, everything seemed to go in. And, and I thought, hey, we're on today. Australia might, might cause an upset. And then when you saw them, you know, 15 points up over the Dream Team, I think that the whole nation were, were starting to believe that, hey, you know, this can happen. We're, we're on the verge of history. But um, look, I think that that first half, we were just playing at our optimum and, and that's going to burn you out, I think. At both ends of the floor, we were really hassling the USA. I mean, they hit, I think, one from 10 three-pointers in that first half, which is very unlike them. Uh, conversely, pretty much everything we were throwing up was going in. So, uh, and, and then that last two minutes before halftime, it just hurt. Uh, we saw a lead of 15 points evaporate to three. And then in the second half, the Dream Team went to another level and we just didn't have the gas to go with them. Uh, I think we were sort of burnt out from that first half. It would have been demoralising going in with just that three-point lead, given the dominance we had over them. Mm. Uh, and, and yeah, that second half, they shifted gears and, and we just couldn't go with them. So um, disappointing, but uh, the future's bright for the Boomers. I mean, I, I know the, the expectation here in Australia is that we will get the bronze medal, but it's not a given. Slovenia have been probably the, the talking point of the tournament. They've, they've really had a great showing. They lost by a point against France uh, to get into the gold medal game. France have already beat the Dream Team this tournament. So it shows the level Slovenia are at. Um, we're not just going to walk up and, and take bronze here. It's certainly not guaranteed. Uh, but given the heartbreak of Rio, we lost by a point to Spain for the bronze medal that day. Uh, I just hope we get it done because they deserve it. They, they, they've played a great tournament and they deserve to walk away with something. Yeah, well, all the action you can watch tomorrow night. That's Saturday, Australian Eastern Standard Time. So don't miss a moment of it. Adam, always a pleasure to get your insights and have a fantastic weekend full of sport. Thank you, James. Thanks for tuning in to Kalkine TV. I'm James Preston, and this is Game On, where we bring you the biggest sports headlines, exclusive interviews, and the latest in the world of sports business. And it's now time to dive into the finances off the field. Let's start sports business with a look at Spain, where La Liga is turning to private equity to resolve its pandemic-related cash shortfall. The premier Spanish soccer league agreed to sell a 10% stake to CVC Capital Partners for 3.2 billion US dollars. The agreement values La Liga at around 28.9 billion dollars. Luxembourg-based CVC, with $114.8 billion in assets under management, has aggressively sought out investments in sports teams and leagues in recent times. In March, CVC agreed to invest up to $508.5 million for a one-seventh share in Six Nations Rugby. Last year, it took a 28% stake in the United Rugby Championship for $169 million. In February, it also invested $300 million in a partnership with the International Volleyball Federation. La Liga needs a majority of the 42 teams in its first and second divisions to agree to the deal for it to move forward, and that's not a foregone conclusion. In May, Bundesliga teams blocked a deal that would have sold a 25% stake in its media rights to private equity firms, including CVC. Serie A clubs did the same on a similar proposal for 10% of the league's media rights, and one of La Liga's most popular teams, Real Madrid, has reportedly voiced concern over the proposed deal, and there's even concerns the deal could have been related to FC Barcelona's recent breakdown of communication with superstar Lionel Messi. From Spain to the United Kingdom and UK public broadcaster, the BBC and Tennis's All England Club have signed a three-year extension to their broadcast partnership, 
which gives the BBC domestic rights to broadcast the Wimbledon Tennis Championship up to and including 2027. The new contract means that the tournament will have been broadcast on radio for 100 years by the time of the 2027 edition. Barbara Slater, the director for the BBC Sport, said Wimbledon has a special place in the hearts of the nation and with this extension we can continue our long-standing and valued partnership with the All England Club. And lastly, if you've been wondering why you can't seem to watch Australia's most recent international 2020 matches, well, that comes down to a decision from the Bangladesh Cricket Board. The Bangladesh Cricket Board sold its broadcast rights to Bantech, a marketing agency in May, this year in a two-year deal reported in local media to be worth around 19 million US dollars. From that point, Bantech then sub-licenses those rights to broadcasters both in Bangladesh and abroad. Subsequent negotiations though with Australian broadcasters including Foxtel and free-to-air broadcasters has resulted in no agreement being formalised which then led rights to instruct broadcasters to black out all of the Australian market including geo-filtering streaming from Australian IP addresses. Now, given you wouldn't have been able to view the series so far, Bangladesh is currently leading 2-0 in a best-of-five series. All right, well, that's all the time we've got for sports business and for Game On. Hope you enjoyed the show. I'll be back with you next week for another edition of Game On. I'm James Preston for Kalkine TV.